this week's edition of the One Shining Moment podcast, the show where we unite the heroes on the field with the heroes on the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. This week, we're changing things up a little bit because our hero on the field also happens to be a hero on the front lines. Her name is Sarah Hoffman, and she is a professional golfer on the Symmetra Tour. For those who may not be familiar, that's the level just below the LPGA Tour. Think of it as the AAA to a Major League Baseball team. Sore subject? Yeah, sorry about that one. Beyond being a professional golfer as well as a nurse, Sarah has a crazy journey to the professional ranks. She took a route most golfers do not take. So One Shining Moment will also take a different route this week, but I think Sarah's story is one that can inspire just about everyone. All right, here it is, this week's One Shining Moment. Honor to be joined by pro golfer Sarah Hoffman. Sarah, thanks so much for joining One Shining Moment. Yeah, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. So, you know, usually as I explained to you, we have two guests here on the podcast. We have a hero on the front line and a hero on the field. You happen to be one of both. Uh, so thank you for all you've done, both for the game of golf and also for all those in need during this tough time. Yeah, of course. So let's start a little bit further back, though, before we jump into your role here during these last few weeks of the pandemic and months at this point. Um, Correct me if I'm wrong. You did not take the usual route of I'm going to graduate college, be a pro golfer, and that's what's going to happen. So you graduate from college. What are your goals when you, you know, get your diploma in August 2013? Okay, so I had to back up just a little bit. So in August of 2012, that was when, or I guess May, that would have been when my season ended for my senior year. Kind of had that conversation with my dad of should I go pro or I have another year and a summer left of nursing school. And he was supportive either way. But when we talked about it a little bit more, uh, my parents had already sacrificed so much for me. So I wanted to kind of be able to pave my own way for my professional journey. So I had won five times my senior year and was wanting to play professional golf or at least saw that that was a possibility. Um, But I also thought I owed it to myself. I was really passionate about nursing. I wanted to finish my nursing degree. So after that year, I hadn't played any golf or at least no competitive golf. So I was in no shape to try and go tee it up at Q school and donate money to the field basically. So I wanted to work for two years and get my nursing skills and really have that solid foundation. So I'd always have that to fall back on. Uh, So I worked for two years, lived at home, saved as much as I could with the goal of always trying to return back to professional golf. So when you're a young kid, we'll even take it a step back further. You know, when you're 12 years old, are you saying you want to be a pro golfer or were you saying you wanted to grow grow up and become a nurse? Um, I was going to be a professional soccer player at 12, I think. And then it changed to basketball. And then, yeah, so I didn't play any AJGA tournaments. Um, I didn't actually play competitive besides my country club, like junior golf. I didn't play any competitive tournaments until senior year after senior year, going into freshman year of college. Um, and nursing was something that was always on my radar, but not, I didn't decide nursing until my sophomore year of college. What was it about nursing that really spoke to you as a potential profession? Um, I had known a couple nurses and like heard what they got to do on a daily basis. And I just like uh, being able to support somebody when they're going through a tough time, but also having that like science background and that, um, knowledge that you can use like different interventions to really help somebody and just I've heard those stories of patients who you know they have that one nurse that really made a difference and I wanted to see if I could be that for somebody else. So two years out of school you know you're you're knee deep waist deep in the nursing profession were you having moments though where you said hmm should I be doing something else right now? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you always look or you always like kind of, you know, throw your net out in the future and you're like, if I, if I look back, am I going to regret what I'm doing? And I was really happy in nursing and I enjoyed it, but I was also playing like the Michigan Open and playing other summer tournaments. And I think it, it was in 
I would have quit in 2000. So it was in 2000, so the summer of 2015, I shot a 66 at the Michigan Open. And I was finally like, okay, my game is coming back. I'm at a point where I have enough money now. I know I can always fall back on nursing. And I have to go and give it a run. I can't, I can't not. Um, I didn't want to look back and have regret of not trying. And at that point, you know, not only are you a nurse in Michigan, you're from Michigan, you went to Michigan. So as far as your golf career goes, do you know at that point you have to leave Michigan? You have to uproot your life a little bit? Yeah, so I'd, I'd gone to Grand Valley State. Um, but yes, I knew that I, I quit in February of 2016, or I went temporary status in 2016. It's February, it's Michigan, there's you know still snow on the ground. So luckily I have a great aunt that lives in Windermere, Florida um and she had three extra rooms so she was living alone she's you know in her upper 80s so she was feeling lonely too so it kind of it just worked out for the best what was the conversation like with your fellow nurses your bosses at the hospital when you say yep uh i'm moving to florida and i'm gonna become a golfer i think they kind of always knew that that was a plan at least for like the last year um, or so the two years was pretty intentional. I worked two years to the day. A lot of times when you're applying for nursing positions, it's they want you to have two full years of experience or be a new grad. So that was kind of to take pressure off of golf that no, I know I knew that I could always go back to nursing and I had already like had that solid foundation. So that was kind of the plan and they knew it, but um, they still give me grief. I've worked there for six years now. So they're like, oh, our local celebrities back or they've hashtagged me uh, scrubs to clubs. And so they go scrubs to clubs to scrubs to clubs to scrub, you know, whatever, however many times I've been back and forth now. So they threw me a going away party yes, uh, last year when I was moving to Atlanta and they're like, why, why are we doing this? We know you're going to be back. And then of course, come, come April, I was back. <laughs> but here's the other thing beyond age, Sarah, um, you moved to Florida, but it's not like you just moved to Florida and you're on the tour. Correct me if I'm wrong. That's not how it works. Yeah, correct. <laughs> so what, so you, you know, you can't just move to Florida and all of a sudden say, I'm a pro golfer. What do you have to do now to actually achieve that dream? Yeah, so in most cases, Q School comes around every August. There's three stages, with the first stage being out um, in California. And there's, you know, 400 people for 90, 90 spots at that point. So um, my, <laughs> my journey is never, like, what you would expect. So I actually, uh, when I got down to Florida, I met up with Don Shin, who's the president of Volvic USA. And he had come to do a press conference at my home course, Travis Point in Ann Arbor, because the Volvic, the LPGA Volvic Championship was coming to Ann Arbor for the first time in May of that year. So in three months when I met him in February. And I was talking to him, I'm like, yeah, I saw you. Um, and I had actually written him an email trying to get a sponsor's invite already. And he's like, yeah, we'll see what happens. But once I introduced myself to him, we were just happened to be playing at the same course and he was actually playing with Sari Pak and she had to leave. So they waved me up because I was playing a single behind them. And then we got to talking and actually that conversation and that round of golf led to a sponsor's invite into the LPGA event in May. So it was three months after I quit my job, I was playing an LPGA event before going to Q school. So that's, that's crazy. I mean, that doesn't happen. And I actually got a sponsor's invite into a Symmetra tour event before Q school as well. Um, so that's just crazy. <laughs> But now those three months, February to May, what, are you just living at your aunt's house or what exactly are you doing do, during yeah, those three months? The practicing every day, um, playing in as many tournaments as I can. So the NWGA or now it's called the Eglin's Best Tournament. Um, Scott Walker runs a really great tour there. So it's mostly based in the Orlando area. So luckily I was able to keep expenses down and just uh, travel to those events and play as much as I could uh, before before the Baltic. And do you have a home country club during that time? Yeah, um, West Orange Country Club in Windermere, Florida. Yeah, I can see where you're going with this. <laughs> For those who may not know, uh, what is the general population of the golf course February, March, May at West Orange? Um, the general population is... Or should I, should I say the median age? 
The median age is, uh, oh, the guys are going to kill me, probably like 60. <laughs> we'll go with 60. And then there's like a handful of professional golfers as well. But um, West Orange is unique where it's not all about the show. It's literally about the company that you have and going out and playing a game that you all love, but then coming back on the patio and, you know, the guys are drinking beers and smoking cigars and their jeans and just hanging out. Was that the culture you were used to in Michigan or? Um, not, no, not so much. It's, uh, Travis Point is a very, um, it's a very nice club and it's not the, you know, West Orange, they call it their boys club. You know, they just, they're, they don't care if the greens aren't perfect, if the, you know, if the course isn't in perfect shape, they're just there to have fun, so. So you're infiltrating the boys club, so I, Yes, yes. <laughs> infiltrated, made my way into the boys club. <laughs> What's, what is day one like? Um, day one, I met a member, um, and I was like, this is great. You know, membership is really friendly. I asked him if they play any money games. I always am interested in playing money games. Um, my that started my dad used to make me play against his friend you know he'd bet on me when I was little um against his friends so I learned to kind of you know stand up for myself and talk a little trash from an early age so uh this member Frank asked me or I asked him if they had any money games he told me come on Friday there's a big skins game so I show up on Friday go to the pro shop try and play my you know 20 or 30 dollars for this team game and they're like uh, I don't, I don't know. You should talk to, you know, you should talk to Jim Carr. You should talk to some of these guys and see if they, uh, maybe Monday would be better. You know, Monday's a, a different game. It's a little bit smaller. It's only nine holes and I get it. I hadn't known them. Also, it's not, they want to be clear. It wasn't a female thing. It was that I was a professional golfer. They didn't necessarily, you know, what tees was I going to play from? They didn't know me at all. So, I didn't get to play, um, a little upset, but it was okay. And then I showed up on Monday with a little something to prove and then I, I won their game on Monday. So, and then the rest is history. <laughs> Did they let you play that Friday? Yeah, they let me play the next Friday and then they're always texting me asking if I'm gonna keep on playing, so. <laughs> so now, once you've done those LPGA events, so you, I assume you then do qualify for Q School in August. Yeah, so I went to Q School. I actually missed qualifying by one shot. Um, I missed qualifying for stage two. So I shot 71-71. I got a phone call at five in the morning that my grandfather uh, passed away. And I shot 79 and then 74. And I missed it by one. So, yeah, it was a little rough. <laughs> yeah. So what's, what's next after that? So then it's back to back to the grind, back to state opens and mini tour events. Um, because I'd only missed stage two by one, I did get some extra tour status. I made it through the cut at stage one. So the next year I got to play in about four events, but it's always, you know, you, know, you can't plan your schedule in advance. It's always kind of finding out maybe even on a Tuesday that you're gonna tee it up on Friday and trying to drive to New York or, you know, whatever the case may be. So. I don't think I was prepared to have success and I didn't make any any cuts that year um but I was having some success on NWGA events and I won the Tennessee Women's Open so I was still seeing progress which was good but then uh, but otherwise you know you're just at West O with the with the with the with the guys otherwise I'm at West Orange with the guys trying to hustle for you know five ten fifteen twenty dollars wherever I can <laughs> And I hear they had a nickname for you, too. Yeah, they, uh, they called me the Trash Queen. So one of their games is, is called Trash Game. And it's basically you get a, a point for birdies, a point for sand saves, um, a point for skin, closest to the pin, things like that. So that Monday game that I played with them, we won the trash. And they nickname everybody. So they started calling me the trash queen because I won the trash game. But now it's turned into they say that I talk too much trash. So now what are some like, of, what, what are some of the other nicknames? Like are are they quite like that or is trash queen like that pretty much sets the bar really high? Um well there's a uh one guy's called Big Ten because he made a ten on a hole one time. Um one guy's called Flex because he thought he was going to drive the green one time. He started flexing, and then he came up like 30, 40 yards short. So they're all, you know, they're all good fun. Um, but, yeah, I, I, like my, I like my nickname. I'll own it. 
Has it caught on? Do the girls on the tour call you the trash? Oh, no, that's, that's like strictly, you know, like when you have a nickname that only your dad or mom can call you. That's like, that's reserved for the boys at West Orange. You gotta so I'm be a totally different person around them than I am on tour. I'm not like talking trash on tour or anything like that. You got to be careful. So real nerd alert here. I went to a sports broadcasting camp and they give everyone nicknames there too. And they yeah. called me Obi because my last name is O'Brien. Yeah. Turns out my grandpa had gone by Obi in a previous life. So my oh, parents wow. start calling me that. Then I was on a local uh, cable show up in New York, New Jersey, and yeah. all my friends at home are watching. And my teacher from camp is the host on the MSG network. And he, of course, doesn't know, you know, he doesn't call me Mia. He just calls yeah. me Obi. And yeah. so I go to school the next day and they're like, Obi. And I'm like, <laughs> dang it. <laughs> so you never know. You never know. It, it could catch yeah. on. It could yeah, catch well, it's, on. It's TQ for short, just in case anybody, you know. <laughs> we like that. That's good. TQ. Yeah. So, so you're with the guys. And when, it, at what point do you finally, you know, feel like, okay, here I am. I'm on the tour, you know, this is actually happening. Or are you still searching for that feeling? Um, still searching. So 2016 would have gone to Q school. I've had some rough luck at Q school. Um, I have played well and felt like I was ready to play really well at Q school. And then 2017, so I won two events leading into Q school. Um, and then I just, I shot 69 the first day. I was playing really well, like, you know, top 20 at that point. And then the next day I get to the range, I feel like I'm going to be sick and like super nauseous. Um, and the feeling just never goes away up until like two more weeks later, I'm at uh, the Colorado Open and I end up going to the ER. I had a stomach ulcer. So um, I, if that had been any other day besides Q school, I would not have continued to play. It was, I was sick um, and super, super painful. So I didn't make the cut that, that year. Um, and so then I was like, okay, another year of state opens and mini tour, mini tour life, which is a struggle. But luckily, you know, we have it better than women have had it before us. So it's, it's doable on mini tours, especially working uh, as a nurse in the off season. So I just kind of did, I knew that I kept on improving. And as long as I kept on seeing improvement, I wanted to keep going back. So in... Uh, so that was 2018. I went out to Q school and uh, tied for 16th at uh, stage one. So I made it to stage two. Um, and then I was actually tied for the lead after, uh, after the first day of stage two. And then I had a rib pop out. So I missed, <laughs> I missed Q series. I missed Q series by one shot that year. Um, so I don't know what it is about Q school. I, I think you know, this year Q school's canceled. Maybe that's for the best for me. I don't, I don't know. So, unfortunately, you, know, you lose your grandfather, stomach ulcer, and then a rib popped out. Yeah. And last year I had to withdraw, so. <laughs> what keeps you going? Why do you, what, why do you keep saying that th this is a possibility for you to make it as a professional golfer? I think um, there's a couple things. I'm super competitive. I don't care if we're playing golf for a dollar. Like, I want to win. I don't care if I'm playing dominoes with my grandma. Like, I want to win. Um, so just that, like, internal competitive drive that I just want to be the best that I can be. Um, so that's one. Two, I keep seeing improvement. I keep, you know, last year I made 10 out of 20 cuts when I hadn't made a cut before. So I see that. And then the other thing is just playing on the LPGA and just having those like first tee jitters and playing against the best women in the world. And I see what they're doing. And, you know, I, my good shots are as good as their good shots. It's just, you know, kind of managing the mistakes. And, you know, as long as I keep on seeing improvement, I, I want to keep on doing it because I don't want to regret, you know, quitting too early. Okay. So first week of March, um, as we all know, the second week of March is when things started changing in our world. Yeah. Um, walk me through what your March was like from that tournament to then obviously where things transpired. Yeah. So early March, we had um, actually the LPJ commissioner, Mike Wan, and the Symmetra Tour commissioner, Mike Nichols. We had a, a mandatory player meeting at that first event and was basically like, you know, there's going to be some hand sanitizer on the tee. We don't want you shaking hands, kind of keep keep a little bit of distance. Um, but at that point it was mostly just in Washington. And so 
it was like kind of felt a little surreal like is it really here like I don't know but like we're gonna take precautions um and then our schedule was set that we had a two-week break already after our first event and then we were gonna have two weeks in California so kind of made it seem like maybe California will be canceled but we're not sure so played that event, made the cut, go back to Atlanta, keep practicing. We get word that uh, California is um, going to be at least postponed. So we're not going out to California. So in our schedule, we had those two weeks in California, and then we had another month off. So at this point, I know that I have six weeks off um, and not quite sure, you know, I've never lived through a pandemic, not quite sure how this is going to go, if we're going to resume play as normal after those six weeks or what's going to happen. So at that point, I was trying to find a travel contract job in Atlanta for nursing, which basically just means instead of working for a hospital, you work for a travel agency and you go in and help. Usually they want like a 13 week contract, which is why I was having a little bit of difficulty trying to find one because I just wanted to work six weeks. If we already had a shortened season, I didn't want to have to be taking off events um, to be working. So trying to find like a four to six week contract that didn't happen. So I was in Atlanta just social distancing on my couch, you know, trying to read some books, doing some puzzles, um, waiting to hear word on contract, didn't get it. Once we got another postponement that, you know, we're not coming back um, when those six weeks are over, that's when I uh, called my manager at U of M and asked uh, if I could come back to work. You are part of the orthopedic trauma unit. Yes. Mm -hmm. So typically in a non-pandemic time, you are not dealing with patients with respiratory illnesses, with all the different symptoms we've seen during COVID. Yeah. I mean, we'll have patients with comorbidities that have like COPD or anything like that, but it's like a chronic condition that's managed. It's not like an acute um, exacerbation of like a disease or something. Yeah, that's correct. So you returned to your hospital um, in the however many months since you had last worked there during the off season. Four months. Yep. In those four months, what had changed? Um, a lot. Obviously, I think everybody's world had kind of changed in those four months. But for me specifically, um, we had had to have mandatory training um, for how to handle COVID-19 patients and um, just what to look for, what interventions we could do. When I got to the hospital, um, I couldn't go into my normal entrance. I had to find a different entrance to go into. We had a checkpoint um, where you're just asked if you have a fever. Uh, cold cough or flu-like symptoms. You get a mask that you have to wear for the next 13 hours of your day. Um, and then as far as my unit specifically, at that point, we didn't have any um, COVID positive patients on my unit. Um, the University of Michigan had developed a specific ICU for COVID patients and we had all the other ICUs um, mostly had those patients. But for me, all the orthopedic, the elective cases had been canceled. So, you know, your typical knee and hip replacement surgeries that we see quite a bit of, obviously, are, you know, considered elective. So they're postponed to save room for these COVID patients. And um, so we have all, we were kind of like a clean surgical unit. So we had um, all sorts of emergency surgeries. So because of the nature of an emergency surgery, it's somebody's a little bit they require a higher level of care. So it was different in the fact that like, it was very, it was a little bit more fast paced, something taking care of patients that, you know, I'm not used to seeing um, surgeries that I'm not used to seeing. So it was definitely a fast paced learning, learning environment for sure. But it ne you never dealt with COVID specific patients? No, no. Um, rule out patients. So like PUIs, like patient, people under investigation, but, um, if they were deemed to be COVID positive, they had to get to the ICU or at least closer to the ICU um, because they, they really go downhill very quickly. What do you say to those patients that you know, it's, it's a different kind of struggle that maybe isn't getting as much publicity right now? Yeah, I think that's really tough. Um, just kind of reassuring them that I'm, I'm there for them. Maybe that means spending a little bit of extra time in their room or maybe even charting in the room where normally I would be charting in the nurse's station. But if I take that extra couple minutes and just chart a few things in their room, I can be talking to them while I'm doing that. Um, and then, you know, Michigan Medicine is great where we actually have some iPads 
So I was able to get an iPad for a patient who didn't, you know, didn't have a phone. So then she could FaceTime her family and things like that. Just trying to do the best you can in, you know, with your circumstances. How would you describe these last two months for you emotionally in the role that you are in? Um, I think rewinding back to the decision of going to the hospital or not. Um, I was in a position where I didn't need to go back to work, fortunately. Um, and it was really tough. I, I struggled with the decision a little bit of is, you know, should I be putting myself at an increased risk? At that point, I was thinking I was going to have to live with my parents. So I didn't want to put them at an increased risk. And when I would go to the worst case scenario of, you know, Michigan was a hotbed when I decided to come back and we already had 250 patients in the hospital and it was climbing. So, you know, they said that maybe we weren't going to get patients, but at that time we really didn't know. We thought we were going to have COVID patients on my unit. So that was extremely tough, but I also knew that everybody was trying to do the best that they could in the community and doing what they could. And I didn't want to look back and regret, you know, not helping out as much as I could. So I came, I came back. I was very anxious. I also hadn't been to work in four months. So that's a little bit, um, you know, it's like riding a bike, but it's like riding a bike on maybe gravel in the beginning. Like You're managing, but you feel a little stressed out. So it was stressful for sure. But once I got back to work and was around my coworkers and my, you know, my leadership team, it really, um, it was a smoother transition than I thought it was going to be. And then honestly, it was, once I got to work, it, it felt good to be feeling like I was making a difference in some patients' lives and really trying to help them through a tough time. Um, it was, uh, it was a lot more rewarding than I guess sitting on the couch and just keeping distance from people. So Correct me if I'm wrong, you did not end up staying with your parents. I didn't, no. So I, um, my, par my parents are in their 60s, so just didn't want to put them at an increased risk. But my coworker luckily had a couple extra rooms, so um, I ended up staying with a coworker. What was that like for your parents, knowing that you're there, but y you can't really see them? Yeah, so I um, had seen them, you know, from a distance and just kind of said hi, but it was, it was, it was weird. It's kind of one thing, high, you know, like uh, waving at your friends or whatever from a distance, but like seeing your parents and not having seen them in, you know, four or five months, you want to give them a hug. But um, yeah, it's a, it, it was a little bit weird. Luckily, golf courses have opened up. Um, so I've been able to play Travis Point. I've been able to see them. Um, but yeah, just not being able to hug your mom and dad is, uh, is very strange because I'm sure everybody knows right now. So, especially when, like you said, you only get to be back in Michigan. How, how often? Yeah, exactly. So you are playing Travis Point a little bit. Um, yeah. are you, do you have like a training regimen or is it kind of just, cause you're probably wiped. I mean, you're working 13 <laughs> hour shifts. Yeah. So working three twelves a week and I was actually, I was picking up a little bit over time at first too. Um, yeah, the training regimen <laughs> went out the window a little bit. I was still playing. Uh, my coach, Will Ellender, is at Fox Hills, so in Plymouth, Michigan, so or not too far away. Um, so I've been working with him a bit and just trying to play as much as I can. The ranges were closed. Everything, like practice facilities, were closed. So basically, I thought it was an advantage just to be touching my club. A lot of girls, their golf clubs were still closed. So it's kind of like a, we're treating it as a second off season. And as I am turning 30, I don't want to be pushing it too hard before season starts because there were talks that we were going to have a bunch of events right in a row. Unfortunately, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, but so I was just trying to like, you know, have that balance of resting a little bit and just like having fun going out and playing with my parents. So that, that will all change here coming in June. I'll start ramping up the practice a lot more. So when you look at the, these last few months, as much as, you know, maybe your training hasn't been what you wanted it to, how do you think this experience maybe has helped you as a professional athlete? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I think just learning to be flexible, one, and learning to just be grateful for what you have, two. Um, fortunately, like, I don't know of anyone personally, like in my family, that's um, been sick. My my aunt did test positive and she was in the hospital, but she's recovered and at home now. Um, 
but yeah, I just think like waking up every morning and being grateful for what you have and just trying to make the most, uh, make the most of, of what you have. Like you mentioned, Sarah, June is when the training ramps up. What are you hearing as far as a return to play for Symmetra Tour? And obviously we know the PGA Tour will be returning in June. What are you hearing mm -hmm. about you guys? So we're going to start July. I think, I believe it's 24th, the last week of July in Battle Creek, Michigan. Um, we'll have two events, Battle Creek and then South Bend, and then we'll have a couple weeks off. And then we're kind of clustering at two or three, two or three week events. So we'll have like two events, two weeks off, two or three events, two weeks off. Um, and we have nine total events scheduled uh, for this year. So it all depends, obviously, um, the both commissioners are taking in advice from local health experts and the governments, and we'll see how restrictions are lifted and how that affects everything. But um, luckily that's above my pay grade. So I'll just be ready to play when they tell me it's time. Are you feeling good about golf's return? Are, we, are you feeling socially distant? You feel like golf's gonna be okay? Um, I think golf in like the recreational sense right now is great. Like I've, you know, played multiple rounds with my parents. I haven't come within six feet. I think it's, you know, a great sport, especially if everyone has their own cart or if you're walking that super easy, they took the rakes out and, you know, they have special cups now. And so I feel great about that at a, as a recreational uh, sport. It's going to be interesting. And I know the commissioners are working hard on trying to figure out how that's going to work on a professional level. Um, especially like on the putting green in the morning when, you know, you have 50 girls for practice rounds. So you, we've had a line of like 50 girls waiting on the first tee. So I know they're implementing different changes. Um, we'll just see. I don't know. It, it's going to be interesting. Or do you feel like your nurse cap will somewhat be on or are you feeling like, are, are you going to be thinking about nursing while you're on the course or is it just going to be locked in? I think I'll, I mean, nursing doesn't ever really go away. So, you know, I might see someone coughing without covering their mouth or like not using hand sanitizer or something. And like in the back of my head, I'll be like, mm. but uh, I think when I'm golfing, I'm hoping to be able to just kind of focus in on golf. Well, Sarah Hoffman, you are the epitome of one shining moment, a hero off the field and a hero on it as well. Thank you so much for all you have done for the community in Michigan and the golf community as well. Thanks, Obi. Ah, uh, so many of you thought I only went by the nickname Mo Brian. Heck no. Shout out Mike Quick as always at the Bruce Beck and Iron Eagle Sports Casting Camp. And shout out and thanks again to Sarah for joining me today for this long form version of the One Shining Moment podcast. If you'd like to learn more about Sarah, you can visit her at Sarah underscore Hoffman underscore golf on Instagram. If you'd like to learn more about the Symmetra Tour and the road that Sarah took, you can visit at Road to LPGA on Twitter. And they are, of course, just right down the road from us here in Jacksonville in Daytona Beach. And I probably should say thank you to the boys at the West Oak Club. I am probably going to have to pay a visit there at some point to thank them for allowing us to talk about them at length on this podcast. If you know of a hero on the front lines or a hero on the field who would be a great addition to the One Shining Moment podcast, be sure to let me know. You can email me at mobrian1 at firstcoastnews.com. There's that mobrian. Or you can hit me up on Twitter at Mia O'Brien TV. We've got a great list of guests coming up in these next few weeks. It doesn't matter if you are a Gator, a Knoll, a sports fan or not. We've got some awesome stories to share and some great moments to create. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy, and we'll catch you later.